Now coming back to PKI with the encryption basis covered, what are the build, various building blocks? Because we'll be using these all through the presentation. So there are multiple building blocks to PKI. There is a certificate authority, an authority which has the power to issue certificates. That is a trust, trusted authority. It's a trust point which can issue certificates. So if I go to say VeriSign and say VeriSign, give me a certificate for my web server, what I'm doing is I'm trusting VeriSign as my certificate authority. And who am I? I'm a client, I'm a requester. What is the registration authority? Registration authority is a subset of a certification authority. It's by the name which, which you want to register a certificate or get a certificate issued. Then there is a certificate signing request, that is a CSR. So for getting a certificate, that is getting my own identity certificate, I have to generate a certificate signing request. Now that certificate signing request will go to a certificate authority or its subordinate, will be signed by it, and returned to me as an identity certificate. So a CSR becomes identity certificate once it has been signed by a CA or a subordinate CA. There, there is a concept of CA chain as well, which we'll uh, soon cover in the, in the next slide. Then there is a CA certificate. So obviously, when a CA is being looked upon as a trusted identity, it has to prove its, its uh, identity to the requesting client. That is, whenever I would initiate a session after getting a certificate, I would say, are you what you claim to be? At that point in time, how would CA identify itself? So that's why it also issues a root certificate, that is a CA certificate, which will help you exchange its public key with the CA and authenticate that, yes, that is indeed the authority which issued me this certificate and I can initiate a secure session with it. Now there is server. In case of server, it could be a web server. It could be an FTP server, it could be an SFTP server. So depending upon what type of server it is, it's the entity which is serving the data. And accordingly, there is client which is trying to access the data or trying to request the data from the server. As I said earlier in the, in the previous slide, it's, there is a concept of certificate chain. So what is a certificate chain? Now, for example, VeriSign is a huge certificate authority. It issues thousands of certificates every year. Now, imagine if they had only a single server doing all of that. That would be too much. So what is usually done is the root CA, that is the CA, the top level CA, like a top level domain, it's, it's kept active and it certifies a number of subordinate CAs or intermediary CAs. At that point in time, the request from the client or the requesting server for signing goes to a subordinate CA, which signs the certificate on behalf of the root CA, that is, it proxies it, and then eventually what the client gets is, is an identity certificate, that is the signed CSR, the intermediary CA certificate, as well as the root certificate. So you essentially get three certificates or maybe even more, depending upon how many intermediary CAs there are. So there is a root CA, intermediary one, intermediary two, and so on. So essentially what this is known as is a certificate chain. So it automatically becomes a, a it's a dominoes effect. That is starting from root, it goes to intermediary, and then finally to yourself, that is your server certificate. So essentially it's a chain, it's not a, it's not a direct transit relationship between A and B. So it's A to C to B to B. How essentially, uh, how, uh, the PKI client to server certificate signing works. So the client generates a key pair and generates a CSR because the client needs a public and a private key and it will sign the CSR using its private key, would exchange its public key in terms of the CSR with the CA. The CA signs it or the intermediary CA intercepts the request and signs it depending upon if the CA is, a, is the root CA or the enterprise CA or if there are any subordinate CAs, it depends. And the CA uh, or the intermediary CA intercepts the CSR, signs it with its private key, and then gives its public key in terms of the root CA certificate plus optionally the intermediary CA certificate and obviously the signed CSR, which is now better known as identity certificate. At the end of the day, what happens is the client downloads the, all these certificates 
installs the root certificate or the intermediary HCA root certificate followed by the identity certificate. Now this this process is very sequential because if you if we directly try to install the identity certificate on a server, it may fail because it the server can cannot find the public key associated with the signing private key. Because CA uses its private key, it also gave a public key in terms of root CA certificate. So once we install that certificate, the server itself can check that yes, the identity certificate I'm trying to install on myself is a valid certificate because it, it matches the key signature of the public uh, key I have or the root CA certificate I have on me. So that's essentially an, at the end of the day how the PKI client to server certificate signing uh, request goes and how the reply comes back. So the same model is also being used or leveraged for Cisco UC. With that, we come to the end of the first section and uh, we'll begin with the next section that is an insight to CUCM certificates. Thanks, Akhil. So I'll read the polling question number two. The question is, which CUCM certificate-based services go, uh, do you leverage in the Cisco Collaboration Network? And there are four options. Option A, I'm not sure if I'm even using any certificates-based service till date. Option B, I leverage most commonly used certificates such as Cisco, Tomcat, CAPF, and TVS. Option C, I leverage all available services that use certificates. And the last option, option D, I have plans to think about using certificates other than Tomcat. So please take a moment to respond to this poll. The poll is open on the right-hand side of the console. And also, make sure to submit your questions. Ashish has already started responding. And uh, after the presentation, we'll, uh, we'll have the Q&A session, dedicated Q&A session. So I'll take all the questions directly. Akhil can respond to them. So we'll begin with an insight to what CUCM certificates are all about and how we can leverage these certificates to our advantage. Now, CUCM has multiple certificates for multiple purposes. Each certificate is meant for a specific service. For example, we have the call manager certificate, we have TBS certificate, we have CAPS certificate, and we have phone VPN certificate, and so on, which we'll cover in detail later on in the presentation. So the essence is that there are some certificates which are already there. We need not even uh, worry about them. For example, when you install CUCN and try to access its web-based GUI for administration or OS administration or CCM user, at that point in time, if you try and access it using HTTP, your session is automatically redirected to HTTPS. So what that means is in the background, Cisco Tomcat service is running, which is automatically redirecting session to possibly non-trusted HTTPS web page. That is, it, it's in, it, it is intercepting the communication on port number 80 and redirecting it to port 8443, which is specifically for CUCM web-based GUI. Now, there are certain certificates which are already installed when CUCM is installed, uh, such as the built-in CA certificates, Tomcat, IPsec, TBS, uh, CAPF, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, and call manager. So CAPF is only built when uh, we run the CTL client, and phone VPN is also built when we install this uh, Cisco ASA certificate, self-signed or externally signed certificate. So essentially, there are manufacturing install certificates in context to the endpoint. There can be manufacturing installed, which come uh, pre-installed in the flash of a phone and cannot be removed. Uh, so these certificates are installed during the build of a phone. When the phone is manufactured at a CA, uh, as a Cisco facility, the Cisco CA hardware certificate is installed. Uh, whereas an LSC or a locally significant certificate is a derivation of CAPF, the Cisco authentication proxy function. So only when we enable mixed mode on a cluster, that is we run the CTL client, we'll cover this in detail later on. At that point in time, the phones are eligible to download a CTL, a certificate trust list, that is which members of the cluster they can really trust. So they will only and only communicate with those members and will not communicate with anyone else. And that point in time, a phone, if encrypted, that is an encryption profile is applied on a skinny or a SIP phone, 
at that point in time, the phone will also download a locally significant certificate if configured to do so or can leverage a manufacturing install that is a built-in certificate into the flash of the phone for secure communication with CUCM and other endpoints. Uh, one more thing, and very important though, uh, this point is that the certificates on CUCM, most of them can be signed by an external CA. All of them are by default self-signed. So for example, if we have a Tomcat certificate, it is self-signed. If we have a call manager certificate, it's self-signed. A TVS certificate is self-signed. CAPF when installed, it is self-signed. Phone VPN, unless it's signed by an external CA or third-party trusted CA, it is also self-signed. So what are the various TUCM certificates that are available at our disposal as a UC administrator? There is a CUCM certificate, there is TVS certificate, there are CAPF certificates, TomCAT certificate, IPsec, and phone VPN. So essentially these are these are the major certificates which are available at our disposal. When you log into a CCM OS admin GUI, you go to the security option, go to certificate management, and you click find, you'll see all these certificates as we'll see in the next slide. So what CUCM certificate is being is used for is the CUCM interaction and secure integration with other applications. For example, if I want to enable a secure conference bridge within my organization, what probably I'm going to end up with is exchange the CUCM or callmanager.pem with a conference bridge and then import the router's certificate, self-signed or externally signed certificate into CUCM. So at that point in time, for any secure integration with an application, CUCM certificate will be used. Tomcat is used for CUCM administration OS, user GUI, and from 8.5 and uh, later releases, Tomcat has replaced the directory certificate. It is also used for direct secure LDAP integration. That is, say for uh, with Microsoft Active Directory, if you want to have an SSL connection instead of a regular port 389, we want to leverage uh, 686 or 3289, if I remember it correctly, then at that point in time, Tomcat certificate is something which will be exchanged with the LDAP. TVS is used for security by default, SPD, which is a, a most, more recent feature with 8.x. And in the background, security by default is driven by Trust Verification Service or TVS. IPsec, uh, these certificates are used for two purposes. That is built in when we the moment we install a CUCM cluster every member has an IPsec tunnel going with every other member in the cluster it's implicit there are IP table firewalls and there are IPsec tunnels to protect the intra cluster signaling as DL data traversing within the cluster so that is done by the means of IPsec certificates and also these IPsec certificates can be leveraged for secure CUCM conversation with MGCP and X323 gateways because neither of those two offer signaling encryption. They only offer media encryption, MGCP by SRTP package, H323 by certificate exchange. But then, unless you have a SIP gateway which has an option for TLS, the signaling for MGCP and X323 gateways still travels in clear text. So to secure signaling, we need to create a, an IPsec tunnel either directly from call manager to the gateways or we can have the next hop device, which could be a router with a firewall encryption module, or it could be an ASA firewall as a next hop of CUCM, which can create an IPsec tunnel to MGCP or H323 gateways.